at a bend in the North Platte River. Just upstream from Casper is Red Buttes, a well-known landmark from the earliest period of overland traffic. The Red Buttes mark the border between Lakota country and Shoshone country. The Arapahoes knew it as an important river crossing. The river that immigrants had followed for hundreds of miles as they traveled across the west turns to the south here. Some of them would cross the North Platte River at the Platte Bridge Station. Well, up here along the immigrant trails, organized groups really get started 1843. And in this area that we know now as Wyoming, it's pass through country. You're just trying to get through the country. So you've got people going to Oregon, uh, you've got people going to California, you've got the Salt Lake uh, Mormon migration. Early on, relations between the, uh, the army and, and the tribes was cordial. The transcontinental trails exploded from a few thousand a year to 25,000 in 1849, 50,000 in 1850. And there was, as you can imagine, growing friction along the trails between all these white immigrants and the people who lived here, the tribes. Out of that friction came a call from the government to get the tribes together in a big treaty east of Fort Laramie in 1851. There were 10,000 Indians there, a place called Horse Creek, east of Fort Laramie. Lakota, Cheyenne, and Arapaho did come, and, and hundreds and thousands of, of teepees are set up. The proposal from the government was, and the Indians sort of signed off on it, was that there would be separate territories outlined in the West for different tribes. This was the first time this had been done in this part of the West. It was gonna divide up basically the properties south and west of the Missouri River and north of Texas, assign different tribes to different areas, and then also set up safe passage for this immigration trail that's moving right through the middle of all of it. Indians walked these lands for thousands of years before any settlers stepped foot here. They lived off the land and hunted buffalo for food. In 1859, the gold found in the Colorado Rockies brought a flood of settlers who competed for natural resources and killed many of the buffalo that the Cheyenne and Arapaho needed for living. In the summer of 1864, small raids by tribal members led to some settler deaths. Colorado's territorial governor ordered formation of the 3rd Regiment Colorado Volunteer Cavalry, commanded by Colonel John Shivington. Cheyenne Chief Black Kettle set up a camp along Sand Creek, north of the Arkansas River, as instructed by Army commanders. Among those with him were Arapaho ancestors of Benjamin Ridgely. Our tribes wanted peace, because there was a lot of uh, settling that was starting to come there. The uh, railroad, the um, trails, and then the discovery of gold brought a lot of hardships towards uh, land, land disputes, our hunting areas. Donovan Sprague is Miniconju Lakota, the great-grandson of High Backbone, known as Hump One. Donovan also goes by the name Hump and is related to the Oglala Lakota Crazy Horse and the Northern Cheyenne leader Dull Knife or Morning Star. With the Sand Creek area, that is uh, part of the Cheyenne country. Our Cheyenne and Lakota are very nomadic hunting groups following buffalo all up and down the plains, leading to the high plains. It's one of the prime buffalo hunting areas. Lynn Wood Tallbull is a descendant of the Cheyenne Dog Soldier Warrior Society leader, 
Little Wolf. The Sand Creek, from what I uh, gathered, is that they had an American flag. They were promised peace. They were under the understanding that they were under the protection of the United States government, the United States Army. They were where they were supposed to be. They had an American flag in front of his teepee, but they did not acknowledge this. So with the orders given by Shivington, they took their cannons there, their high-powered rifles. They approached the camp and caught our people off guard where they figured they were at peace and they didn't uh, wasn't going to be uh, bothered by uh, any military. And then the attack began. Soldiers came upon us from all sides. Shots went through my shield, but I was not hit. I saw many women and children dead and dying. Little Bear, Cheyenne Warrior. They tried their best to survive. And I think with all of that killing and uh, wounding of uh, our people, they didn't know how, how to help themselves. With helping each other, being shot, getting hit by uh, the shrapnel. And I know that mainly was just trying to escape kind of elements of running with only moccasins on or even bare feet. Shevington obeyed orders he had from his commander, uh, General Curtis, the department commander, the Department of the Missouri, that he didn't want any peace made with the Cheyennes or Arapahoes until they suffered more. Calvary and the volunteers out of Colorado uh, still attacked and uh, they killed mainly women and children. When they returned, they displayed the body parts that they had taken at Sand Creek. People cheered them. They were glad had, uh, the Rocky Mountain News declared it a great victory against savagery to make the territory safe, and especially the city of Denver. Within the battle, it was a massacre. It's really the most dastardly episode in uh, American history of broken promises, followed by a massacre. Following the Sand Creek, Moving into the, the first part of the year of uh, 1865, you had an alliance there of Lakota, Cheyenne, Arapaho. The survivors gathered up at the Cherry Creek camp of the dog soldiers. Many of them had heard the Southern Cheyennes talk of the Sand Creek Massacre in all the bodies that they saw in there. Many of the societies wanted to get even. Many of them just heard that their, their relatives or their friends had gotten killed there and he had been mutilated. This uh, made many of the warriors cry. The Lakota and Cheyenne and a few Arapaho would take it on themselves to disrupt the travel, communications, wagons, settlement, anything they could do. This involved telegraph, wire, cutting these posts that were not yet U.S. military fort designation, individual ranches, people who had settled. There's a large group of them gather up in the Powder River country, north of here. Now, we know some about what happened there because George Bent, 
who rode with the uh, Cheyenne sometimes and sometimes with the, uh, the Whites. So he, he crossed back and forth. George Bent was the son of the trader William Bent at Bent's Fort. And his mother was Owl Woman, who was a Cheyenne. So he was a mixed blood. He was half white, half Cheyenne. He shared many of these stories with the people at the Platte River with the Indians. And it, it angered them very badly. It saddened them very badly. He rode with different societies. He used to talk of how frightening it was to ride with them, to see them, and to go into battle because they were so fierce, so scary. Their magic was so strong. George Bent talks about this gathering uh, of Lakota, Cheyenne, and Arapaho up in the Powder River country to come down here and, and wipe out this particular post and the bridge across the river. War dances were commenced. This meant for Big Raid. Sioux and Arapahoes had war dances as well as Cheyennes. Crooked lances or bone scrapers, bowstring soldiers, fox soldiers, red shield soldiers, dog soldiers, foolish dog soldiers, they were all notified the raid would be made at Platte Bridge from Crazy Woman's Creek. George Bent. In the summer of 1865, following the Sand Creek Massacre, there were a lot of essentially guerrilla warfare type Native American attacks on these smaller telegraph outposts all along the Overland Trail. And you're looking at uh, Cheyenne, Lakota, Arapaho, um, all together, somewhere in the neighborhood of about 1,100 fighting men, in addition to the, the families and everybody. And at that point, they decided to move south, and the target was going to be Platte Bridge Station. So July 25th, 1865, Platte Bridge Station has a garrison of about 120 men, and this includes the band of the 11th Kansas. They are not very well armed, they have very low ammunition, and many of them do not have guns at all. Lieutenant Bretney comes in that night and says there's reports of Indians around, we're in danger of being attacked, and he tells this to Major Anderson of the 11th Kansas. Now, Major Anderson is concerned because his job is to protect Platte Bridge Station. That is his primary focus. And so he's worried because he, although he has over 100 men, they don't have hardly any ammunition. Now, Bretney also informs Major Anderson that on his way back to the post, he encountered Sergeant Custard and his wagon train of supplies heading towards Platte Bridge Station. And Lieutenant Bretney encouraged Custard, don't take a break, get everyone together and get to the fort because there's Indians around, you're in danger, you cannot camp out here. Sergeant Custard doesn't listen to him, really. He's not concerned about it. He's expecting to encounter maybe a group of 20 to 30. They might fire some shots at him, they'll return fire, and the Indians will run off. And Brittany is trying to encourage Major Anderson to please send a detachment of men to go get Custard and bring him back. Well, Major Anderson can't do that because if he sends Lieutenant Bretney out with a cannon and 100 men, that leaves him about 19 men to protect the fort, many of whom don't have weapons. And so Major Anderson basically ignores Bretney and goes back to sleep. Each of the tribes had warrior societies led by men who commanded respect because of their bravery and actions in battle. Among their duties were to determine the order of the buffalo hunts, to train younger men in fighting skills, and how to be a warrior. From our family, Hump, Crazy Horse, Morning Star, also known as Dull Knife. Crazy Horse was not a headman at this time, not from a headman family, but Hump was. And so he'll pick out decoys. Preparation for battle among the Lakota and our family was very important. There were ceremonies that would be held the night before. 
And then each family often had different regalia or paint and that, and even colors sometimes. When they talk about that, they put paint on there. Animals, you know, they had their traditions. They were noble warriors. The plan was a, a decoy tactic to lure soldiers out and then surprise them and then take the fort. Goes back to retaliation from St. Creek. Still hurt. That morning, July 26th, 1865, Martin Anderson orders Casper Collins, who's a lieutenant with the 11th Ohio Volunteer Cavalry and was actually just passing through on the way to his own post at Sweetwater Station, Martin Anderson orders Lieutenant Collins to lead a troop of 20 soldiers across the bridge and to the west to go meet the Amos Custer Army supply wagons and escort them back to the fort. They leave the post early that morning and they go out across the bridge and they see these Native Americans up on the ridge by the telegraph line. Once they got the soldiers away from the fort, they figured how, how they could surround them. Many of them had places to hide and uh, they tried to lure them out. Little Wolf was really good at this. Now, Lieutenant Collins was under orders not to leave the road and stay within sight of the bridge. And so he goes and attacks them. Well, of course, this creates an ambush, and you have the Battle of Platt Bridge. We turned and charged into the thickest of them, drawing our pistols and doing the best we could. It was a terrible ordeal to go through. It was really running the gauntlet for dear life. Sergeant Isaac Pennock, L Company, 11th Ohio Volunteer Cavalry. Casper Collins is killed in this battle, along with many of the members of the 11th Kansas, and the few that survive come back to the fort. Now, all of the soldiers are within Platte Bridge Station, and about 11 o'clock in the morning, Sergeant Custer's wagon train comes into view. And essentially, the same time that they see the wagon train, so do the Indians. As we raised the top of the hill, the whole country appeared to be covered with Indians in front and to our left. Custard and I soon saw it was fight or surrender, and the latter was never thought of with Indians. Corporal James Schrader, Company D, 11th Kansas Volunteer. James Schrader leaves his horse because essentially riding a horse in the prairie, open prairie, makes you a target. And so what they decide to do is to get down as low as they can, basically on their bellies, and they're crawling along the sagebrush, trying to slowly get back to Platte Bridge Station. Meanwhile, the Indians have encircled wagons. The Custard and his men are taking cover behind the wagons, shooting at the Indians. And some of the Indians do spot Schrader and the other men trying to get away and come after them. They were very angry people, angry warriors, and many of them had so many relatives that they lost the Sand Creek Massacre. So they, uh, or even in any battle, they always tried to get even some way. If a man went to battle and lost his life, he was honored. And so this fight lasts for about five hours. The Indians circling the wagons, attacking them, them taking cover behind the wagons, shooting back. And all of this is happening within sight of Platte Bridge Station. We could see the Indians in swarms charge down upon our boys. They would roll volley after volley into them. At about 4 p.m., the firing ceased, and the smoke, that of the burning wagons, commenced descending. Sergeant Isaac Pennock, L Company, 11th Ohio Volunteer Cavalry. The Battle of Red Buttes was not a blip in any way. It was a culmination of 
some of the northern bands of Indians who saw the trail degradation and wanted to put a stop to it. The summer of 1865 was a direct result of Sand Creek. You had these conflicts and, and people shooting at people, battles that actually got names like the ones that were here, but you had this conflict all up and down the, the area. After the fight here at Platte Bridge and the fight at what's become called the Battle of Red Buttes, that's a huge victory for the tribes. The following year, 1866, the army is ready to make peace with the tribes and tries to. A peace commission comes to Fort Laramie and the tribes are gathered there. But right then, this Colonel Carrington comes through with several units of cavalry and infantry right on their way to go up the Bozeman Trail and build three army forts in immediately in open violation of the 1851 treaty. There would always be agreements, you know, that uh, we're not gonna go any further than this. You have fights that, again, a few guys shooting at a few guys, lots of that was happening. But you also get fights that, that end up with names, like the wagon box fight, where an army group is out cutting firewood and they're attacked. You also have the, the Fetterman fight, which was uh, soldiers lose 80 guys. All of these conflicts were resulted two different two different people trying to occupy the same area and, and live in the same area. Proud to say that, you know, the humps were there and Crazy Horse was there. And our family was all, you know, represented there. And in 1868, you get the new Fort Laramie Treaty of 1868, where the army agrees to pull those forts out of that Bozeman Trail country and uh, cede the property back to the tribes that it had originally agreed to give to them. They gave away Fort Field Kearney. The soldiers made an agreement they were going to abandon it, and uh, they would like to give it to the Cheyenne people. While Little Wolf burnt the thing down. When you look at the, the treaties that the uh, federal government made with the tribes, you know, we start off in this area with the, uh, the Treaty of 1851 that divides up the properties, the land, between who's going to live where. Then you have the Treaty of 1861, which again divvies up the land, points out where people are going to live, and takes a little bit more from the tribes. You get the Treaty of 1868, which cedes everything north of the North Platte River to the tribes until gold's found in South Dakota. So each one of these treaties eventually get violated and become obsolete as the United States continues to expand into these areas. So eventually all of the treaties um, are voided. Here all our resources were depleted and the places that we wanted to go couldn't do it no more. You know. That's how history uh, brought us to why we're here today on the reservation. They made us many promises, more than I can remember, but they never kept but one. They promised to take our land, and they took it. Oglala Lakota Chief Red Cloud. The two battles at this location were initially called the Platte Bridge and Custard Fight. It wasn't until the 1920s when Casper historian Robert Ellison renamed the second of those battles the Battle of Red Buttes. Even though that rock formation is not where the fight took place and not even visible from either the military post or the battleground. The Platte Bridge Station and town were almost immediately renamed for the 11th Ohio Lieutenant who died in the first fighting of the day, Casper Collins. History is like an onion with many layers to be peeled back. And the Battle of Red Buttes has layers yet to be uncovered as well. It was fought only yards from housing dotting the low rolling hills of West Casper 
and the remains of Sergeant Amos Custard and the men who died with him were buried on this nearby battlefield. Their precise location is still unknown. Perhaps someday they will be revealed, or perhaps they will continue to lie undisturbed. <laughs>